Welcome to RHI's Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today we are here with Lutz Leichsenring, co-founder of Vibe Lab and spokesperson of Club Commission Berlin. So, uh, Lutz, great to see you again. Yeah, great to see you, Jim. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I think uh, I remember that we met when we were in Ibiza at the uh, International Nightlife Association. And you were exactly. working with the Club Commission, but since then, you've kind of uh, started to work with Vibe Lab. So why don't you give me a little bit of background, first of all, how you ended up getting to do the work that you're doing and kind of what these two different organizations are and how they relate with each other. Of course, yeah. So my, my whole working life is um, tied very closely to nightlife. I started as a promoter. I had a club, I had a restaurant. Uh, for six years. Um, I started one of the biggest uh, platforms about nightlife in Germany in 1999. That was like the early age of internet in, in Germany. Um, and um, then uh, 2009, I became the elected spokesperson of the club commission in Berlin, which is the representative advocacy organization of the clubs, promoters and nightlife people. Um, we have about 300 members. Um, the organization exists more than 20 years now. And um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really um, excited to see that this kind of advocacy work is now evolving all over the world. And um, Vibe Lab was, of course, um, an agency that was um, started to support these offices and support people that are doing this advocacy work. But now we're also do, doing research um, and um, yeah, very purpose driven um, consulting, research, and, and, and work around advocacy groups. Club Commission is really just a kind of a Berlin-based, almost like an association of nightlife people or people who are interested in, in working in nightlife, more or less advocacy to bring about change and policy and resource direction. And Vibe Lab kind of exactly. emerged with the whole Night Mayor movement, uh, right, that uh, Merrick started, and uh, or at least he didn't necessarily start, but he made it a, a term of art around the world. A global right? thing. He made it a global thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know there was a, a, some work in the, in the, in the, well, we started doing work in the US in the 90s, but then in the UK, you know, they began to really brand that nighttime economy and had the purple flag and the nighttime economy managers that were set up. But Mira kind of created the term that most people could relate to that made it a much more popularized uh, initiative. And so that's how Vibe Lab came together, right? It was kind of to, to, to capitalize and take advantage of this global network and to form a way in which to help different cities that are moving in this direction. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and I must say the Club Commission is still, um, you know, very cutting edge when it comes to nighttime advocacy. We have now 15 employees. There's a board of uh, 11 people that are doing this voluntarily. Um, we have a budget of 3 billion per year. Um, we're working a lot with the city. We have a um, soundproofing fund where we fund actually um, soundproofing work, uh, uh, construction work in clubs. So you, have, you don't have troubles with your neighbors. Um, we, we do a day of club culture where every participant gets 10,000 euros from the city of Berlin um like every club or collective that is uh, taking part of so it's really grown to to a very strong organization that is um yeah also a role model for many other cities of course i was not aware about the kind of the public uh, investment so do these funds come from government or they come from uh the private sector or is it a combination there is a bit of membership fees but uh, most of the cake comes from the government and uh, different uh, government institutions. So there is funding from the economic department, which is uh, more towards, uh, um, you know, supporting the technology behind it, supporting the innovation. Um, there is funding from the cultural department when it comes to consulting and networking and uh, supporting grassroots movements. Um, then we get uh, funding from the social department when it comes to awareness uh, of um, drug awareness prevention programs. Um, we have um, ties to the um, city development department. Uh, for instance, we have a, we've put out a map where you can see all different 
um, new buildings that are in planning um, mm -hmm. and how they get conflicted with music venues. So we actually oh, know okay. before they're going to be built where conflicts can occur. So there's a lot of uh, ties to the government, but we are still an independent organization. And um, we also, I think we also have to be to be representing these you know, grassroots movements of nightlife. Well, that's quite different than in the US where you have the San Francisco Entertainment Commission, which is kind of a, a quasi regulatory body, but they do some of the same advocacy or focus on, you know, the agent of change policies and things like that. And then the New York and DC offices that were created, but they're built within the infrastructure of the city. And really they serve more of a kind of a liaison to the public than what you're talking about what other cities have gone to the same scale that uh, you have in Berlin with this club commission? Not so many, as you said, there are some um, cities that have more like a government approach, which is a position that they, but also funded. And uh, some, some cities went the way that, that route where you have an independent organization that also gets funding from the city, but still stays independent. Mm -hmm. And some cities have a mix uh, where you have um, a board of people from the night who are also steering this organization, but it's still a government organization. Mm -hmm. um, Vienna, for instance, uh, started also the Club Commission Vienna. Um, and um, I would say the, the Nightmare um, Foundation, which Mirik founded in Amsterdam, it's even very close to what the Club Commission is in Berlin, because it's also an independent organization and gets funded by the city. But it's not a Club Commission, it's a Nightmare. So it's, oh, um, okay. Okay. it's, it's, a, it's a different uh, structure, I would say. Yeah. So talking about the Nightmare and Vibe Lab, now I know that you do a research, this a footprint uh, research, um, and you could talk a little bit about what that means, but um, is that offered through Vibe Lab? Is that kind of the, 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 the more global consulting uh, advocacy work through Vibe Lab that you do? Yeah, I think the research that we're doing is filling gaps that we have seen through what's happening all over the world. And uh, the Greater Footprint is, is a study that we started in Berlin. Then we did uh, the assessment in New York, in Tokyo, and at the moment in Stockholm. And what we see there is um, we are, we're assessing the amount of creative space, but also understand better how these spaces are used. Are they used more experimental uh, when it comes to performances, music, genres? Um, or is it more um, a commercial approach? Um, is it a space for a certain community? Is it like a, a, for marginalized groups, for instance? So these kind of assessments are very important because cities are changing constantly. And with, with the city, the, the spaces are disappearing, popping up, and nobody's really monitoring it. And the creative footprint is measuring where are these spaces? How does the city change um, to the positive, to the negative? and then make decisions. Um, and uh, yeah, I think facts and figures are very important to make decisions. It's not, it cannot be based or rooted in, in, in a, your stomach feeling, um, which a lot of advocates uh, started, you know, with protests and with, mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, emotions. And I think we have to cut, cut to the point where we have the facts and the figures. But what we also did um, to, to, uh, to also develop this study towards more the economic side. And we, for instance, did a study for a German, um, uh, German government uh, organization, which, uh, which wanted to research how COVID hit um, the, um, the creative communities in, in sub-Saharan sub Africa and in the Middle East. And we did a study which is called Voices of Creatives and to understand better how these music design um, fashion people in these different uh, cities in, in Africa and Middle East really survive COVID um, uh, monetarily or how they change professions. Um, and these kind of studies that we're doing are filling gaps, as I said, because there's, uh, we don't see any other, anybody else doing these kind of studies. Yeah, you know, I spoke yesterday, like I told you with Carolina Durant from uh, uh, Bogota, and uh, she said one of the lessons they learned from COVID was that they really didn't have an emphasis on the outdoor space, you know, the outdoor seating, the outdoor performance space, the plazas, you know, and she says now that's become really more or less a part of the city. Um, and, and so that's uh, my question uh, to you is, is when you talk about creative spaces, naturally when you say nightlife to the majority of the people, they'll think of 
uh, after midnight dance clubs with young people, DJs, loud music, people getting drunk, causing all kinds of problems in neighborhoods. But when you say the creative spaces, um, it sounds to me like you're looking beyond that kind of um, what most people would consider a problematic venues to something that's a little bit more expansive. So can you describe what you mean by creative spaces and what you would be looking at? Yeah, so what we're doing is we're looking in the side of the curated nightlife. And curation means there is somebody working with art. And of course, it can be very commercialized art, but it can also be very grassroots, experimental, uh, cutting edge art. And um, music is, of course, one of the biggest drivers. It draws a lot of people, of course, a lot of noise littering is occurring. But we're also looking into um, performance, uh, um, literature, um, uh, visual art, um, so also culinary art, of course, and to understand better where is the curated nightlife, where are the people who have a certain idea that makes the city special, that draws uh, attention and, and creates new things, new sounds, new tastes, and etc. Because I think that is the, the interesting part of nightlife, um, because there is definitely also very commercialized um, nightlife, but they can survive with our, without our help. Mm -hmm. Those are not the, the under pressure communities. Um, so we're looking in both sides, but um, let's say our recommendations are more towards the ones that are really shaping the night. So really kind of your cutting edge where they're not branded in any way or don't have the vehicle for performance, but you're creating those performance spaces. So creative space for us is a space where um, you know where these communities or where, where this this creativity can be, can happen uh, as a, a rehearsal space, but a performance space, um, because those are the ones that are usually lacking in cities. Um, there, those are overlooked. Usually, um, they cannot pay the highest rents, and we have to understand better um, how the, they can fit into the city because they are the ones that actually. If you talk about what is the cool urban nightlife of New York, it's it's not the shopping malls, you know, mm -hmm. and it's also probably not the, the chains um, that are everywhere in, in a city. So, you know, so we have to understand better how the city works. And every city is unique. When we when we did our study in Japan, we, we saw that um, the very, very little space is a bar with five people at the counter uh, with one one bartender. That is mm -hmm. what what makes uh, um, the city unique. It's not the casino that is maybe built. So, you know, it's yes. interesting you brought up culinary. And I think in a lot of ways, and we have a session um, about the whole craft beverage industry, the craft breweries and distilleries, particularly who are moving into urban settings, uh, which are reshaping people's expectations of a social experience. I know where, where I live, you know, we have a, a little brewery um, and they have a little backyard courtyard where they feature local performers. They don't serve food, uh, but they do uh, allow for food trucks to come so you could get, you know, fish and chips or you could get pizza or whatever. So it's, it's integrating a localized experience of independent entrepreneurs and performers. So that whole craft beverage movement, like you're saying, is a creative uh, art in and of itself, but it's also, you know, facilitating other creativity. And then with culinary, which I thought you had made an interesting comment, because I had a big debate with a, a person who is the public art uh, coordinator for the city of San Francisco. And I talked to her about, you know, a chef is, is an artist, you know, and, 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 and culinary arts is an art form. And she argued and said it's more of a craft than it is an art. And I said, well, you know. That's debatable. Yeah, well, that's what we debated quite extensively about it. Because I said, a good chef really blends together, just like an artist will have a, a certain type of canvas with a brush and the way the artist puts the paint on the canvas. That defines that piece of art. I said the same thing as with a chef. It's the, it's the combination of set, smell and taste and texture and the visual look and you the know, presentation. I, I think a good artist is also somehow a craftsperson. You know, a, a DJ also has to understand the craft in a certain uh, yeah. way. You know, so so I, I think yeah, it's it's debatable. It's debatable. <laughs> but, uh, it's debatable. Yeah. 
So uh, how do you how do you think uh, this uh, the 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 impact of COVID uh, is reshaping um, the future of how people will socialize? I mean, I know when I spoke with Mirak the other day, he said, you know, he's gearing much more to the daytime festival, what I would call the daytime social economy versus the nighttime social economy. And I know in talking with some club people here in the U.S they're finding some of the people are saving their money. So instead of going out to clubs five nights a week or four nights a week, they save their monies for they could go to that $300 festival, you know, so that that their disposable money is being reallocated to more of a festival, you know, performance than a going to the nightclub, you know, on a regular basis. How do you see COVID as changing how people will socialize over the next uh, 18 months or so? So, so for us, the recipe to create buzz, to create a vibrant city is always um, depending on three different pillars. It's the creative community, so a, a community that's appreciated and has the ability to perform, rehearse, be, um, be welcomed in the city. The second pillar is to have affordable and accessible space because somewhere this art has to live. Um, and the third one is to have the right framework condition. That means you have um, funding availabilities, you have right, public transportation at night, no? the buses doesn't stop at midnight, because <laughs> after that, you know, who is going out, you know, only the bonds can, who can afford a taxi or, or drive their own car. So, so I think these three um, pillars are, are very, have been under threat um, in many, many cities through COVID. Um, and, um, and in many cities, especially I think in the US, but also in Latin America and Asia, there was not really funding um, and a lot of artists, uh, the creative community could not be um, surviving in their art. You had issues with creative space that you could not pay your rent anymore and you had to close down. And of course the framework conditions with all the regulations, restrictions were, you know, also the whole um, tracing, tracking, whatever. It, it really destroyed the, the original idea of, you know, a, a chaotic nightlife, which mm -hmm. makes it. I think there are, there are some trends that we can see now th which, which happened through COVID. I think there are also some positives. Um, I think there must be a new conversation about what is happening to all these shopping malls when people now are, you know, don't go to retail, they go online now to, mm -hmm. to, to shop. What is happening to all the office spaces when people are doing home office like 20, 30% of their time? Um, and they will continue to do this in, um, uh, in most of the jobs. So I think we have to be sitting at the table when it comes to how to revitalize our inner cities and how to use those spaces in the future and what can co culture and, and culinary and, uh, and everything else can contribute to this. Yeah. I think another trend that, uh, that and, I, and I think those are like very contradictive um, ideas, but I think there, is, there has been already a trend before COVID that people tend to be more healthy, maybe also don't go to very large events, more like in smaller groups, you know, cook together, um, maybe go into the countryside. And through mm -hmm. COVID, I think that get got much more um, intense. And, and I think nightlife had to, has to adjust to this and find solutions to also serve this community that is maybe changing their behavior. And, and I think the other trend is the completely opposite, that people want to live their golden 20s, the, their 2020s, and experience, you know, um, excess and and lose themselves and 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 have fun with a lot of people and and have skin contact again mm -hmm. with a lot of people in the same room. So I think you know it's it sounds contradictive, but maybe that's also where we're heading to. Both we have the very excessive ones and the very healthy way, and maybe people combine it in in their lifestyle. Yeah, Who knows? Sounds to be my, my the fifty years of my life. So. Um, anyhow, this has been a great interview. You've been very informative, and now I'm really understanding more of the great work that you're doing, not only through the Club Commission, but also with Vibe Lab. And I appreciate this opportunity to learn more about it. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to collaborate um, as we move forward and as the world changes. So, uh, but uh, um, I'm, I'm grateful for you to be here, and I'm going to conclude this interview, and, and, and thank you. Thanks, Jim, for, and thanks for your lifelong work in, for nightlife. So thank you for having me.